I'm Mary Elizabeth Elliott with CADCA and your host for today. Coalitions and the dedicated people who work with them have far-reaching influence in their communities. It's sometimes difficult to know how and when to use it. Today we're going to help you better understand your influence. Three influential people are with me today. Sue Thaw is a public policy consultant representing CADCA. She works hard to make sure our elected officials know the importance of coalition work. Heidi Bainbridge is the coalition coordinator of the Van Buren Safe Coalition in Iowa. In her years there, she has had influence in many positive changes. Sue Parr is the chair of Community Coalitions of, of Virginia, a statewide coalition made up of substance abuse prevention, treatment, and recovery professionals. Welcome all of you. Great to have you today. Thank you. Thank you. So let's start with something simple. What is influence? Sue, what is it to you? Influence is being able to convince people that what you think is right is right. It's um, anything as simple as convincing people that the hairdresser that you use is the best person in town to being able to convince a key influential that they should care about the drug issue. And what about our coalition leaders here? I think that influence is really sharing your knowledge with those who may not know, have the same information as you. And so having influence over youth, over adults in power, um, over anyone in your community to share the knowledge that you have about the issues that you're dealing with. And I agree with what Sue and Heidi said. It's all about um, the way you communicate with your community members, engaging them and educating them to make them aware of the issues and then getting them to buy into the strategies that you need to use in order to make a change in your community. Perfect. So Heidi, is it more than just elected officials that we're influencing? Oh, of course. Yeah. Um, you're at, Sometimes you're influencing elected officials, but many times it may just be other coalition members, people in your community. Maybe there's someone who um, doesn't, doesn't quite know as much about you as, on a topic, and you can influence them by sharing your knowledge with them. Um, and youth, you can influence youth as well in your community on the issues that you're dealing with. And does it mean changing laws? So? Well, it definitely can mean changing laws, but to get to that point, you really have to build support for what it is that you're trying to change. And that means influencing everybody from grassroots people to grass tops people who are community leaders. It really has a lot to do with getting people to be on your side and agree with what you're trying to accomplish. So the coalitions are influencing a wide range of people every day. Yes. Everybody. Definitely. And what about, what about parents? I mean, everyone says parents is, is so key to all of this. How do coalitions engage parents? Um, I think parents are one of the key people to have engaged in your um, organization, in the work that you're doing. Um, they are the influence of their children. And so it's important that you can share your knowledge and experience with those people who will be influencing the youth in our community beyond the time that you're with them. Parents set the, the social norms of the community, and those affect everything we do. And so it's very important that we make parents understand the role that they play in their children's lives. And we can do that through all kinds of strategies, parent awareness classes, and just getting them involved in the coalition activities. So now, can anybody have influence? You know, what makes someone good at doing this? I think being a really good communicator having the facts and figures to make your case, and not being afraid to speak out when you have something to say. It's hard to influence people if you're not willing to step out and actually communicate. So you don't have to be the head of the high school debate team, though. That's no, my. I think anybody <laughs> who um, has the courage of their convictions and is willing to share their opinions, especially when it's based on, on facts and statistics and knowing what's going on, can have great influence. What do you guys think makes a particularly effective advocate, Heidi? Um, I think you need to be passionate about what you're dealing with. Um, it, it can't just be a job, it needs to be something that you really care about. And um, coming from that place usually has more influence and you have um, a better chance of, of influencing the people you're dealing with if it really is from the heart and something that you're passionate about. 
Yeah, doing your homework, you know, knowing, you know, having the knowledge that you have, but then also doing your homework about the people that you're approaching and what's going on in your community and being able to tie that all together and really communicate the big picture when you go into a group and try to convince them that this is what's best for their community. Well, we talked about the fact that coalitions influence a wide variety of, of people in the community, but who do they need to influence? Is there some folks that are more uh, critical for, their, for our work than others? Sue? I think it depends on what it is you're trying to accomplish. If you're trying to change social norms, as um, Sue said, parents are critical. If you want to change um, an ordinance or a law, it's very important to influence elected officials. It really depends on what you're trying to accomplish and who your audience is. And then you really need to um, prepare what it is that you're trying to do to fit that audience and what they actually are interested in accomplishing as well. And how about for you guys? Is there also some influencing of your own coalition members that goes on? And, and what does that mean? I would say definitely we have to influence our coalition members. Um, there's a lot of times that we are the experts, um, but it requires a community to have an influence. And if we don't share that, that knowledge that we have gained with those coalition members, I think um, our influence is not going to go as far. Yeah, making sure we're all on the same page, that we all have the same understanding and that we understand how that, that things impact our community and then carrying that forward as a, as a team really is much more impactful than just one voice in the community. And Supar, I mean, having a statewide coalition, are there some special skills that you would need to have as an influencer there? I think being a statewide coalition leader requires just the higher level of those skills. I mean, you're working across the state, you're interacting with different people on different levels all the time. You still have to start at the basic community level, but you have to, to times that by 50 <laughs> and reach out to all the communities and try to get them all on the same page for the same cause. But by using the voices of the community coalition leaders throughout the state, that certainly makes a good team effort. And are there different um, ways between prevention and treatment and recovery that you're, you're working with all of those professionals? Are there different ways that you use that yeah. influence? When we started, it was just hard to get everybody using the same language, getting everyone to understand how we all played a role in each other's success. And by really exploring that and having everybody come to the table together, it was much easier to see the big picture and see how those three components interact and the importance in supporting one another's efforts, how much more successful we are when we all work together. Absolutely. Well, now, Sue Thaw, this is a question for you, and this is something we get a question at mm -hmm. CADCAP lots. What is the difference between lobbying, now we'll talk about the influence in policy, lobbying and advocacy. Well, lobbying is taking a specific position on a specific piece of legislation, so it's a term of art. Advocacy is just advocating for something that you're interested in seeing happen. So there's, there's a tremendous difference. One is only really about trying to get a piece of legislation passed and doing what you can to make that happen. And advocacy is doing whatever you can to um, educate people about your position and why you think something needs to be changed and to make the case for it. That's not lobbying at all. Right. So we, we live every day as advocates, right? Mm -hmm. But we might do some lobbying at a certain time. And how do, we, how do coalitions work that as far as lobbying is concerned? Well, if a coalition is a 501c3 or under the umbrella of a 501c3, they are 100% allowed to do lobbying, taking a specific position on a specific piece of legislation. It gets tricky because if you are a federal grantee, take any federal money, you can't use any of your federal money to lobby, but it doesn't mean that you can't use non-federal money or non-restricted money to actually do lobbying, which is legal for 501c3s. You just have to be very careful which sources of funding you're using to do what. And Sue? I was just going to say, that's been really 
that the one of the good purposes of the state coalition is that as a 501c3 they have more leeway and especially with the partners statewide we can utilize those partnerships and the 501c3 umbrella of the state organization to do the lobbying component that's so important whereas as dfc grantees and and people under federal funding we can do all the advocacy that will support the lobbying efforts. So that makes for a nice combination. So what if you don't receive federal funds? Well, at that point, people can certainly on their own time, when they're not charging anything to the grant, the federal grant, they can do advocacy. And it's extremely important to rely on partners in the community and partners in your coalition who can legally do lobby lobbying. And the, the other really interesting thing is, 501c3s can actually use up to 20% of their first $500,000 in income to lobby. And your federal money counts towards that $500,000 in income, although you can't use any of it. Mm -hmm. So I'd say hold a bake sale, ask everybody on your coalition to throw $50 in a hat and raise just enough money so that you have something to charge direct lobbying to when and if you need to do it. And have you, um, in your community, Heidi, have you sort of followed those guidelines or how has that worked for you? Definitely, we always make sure we follow the federal guidelines with the funds that we, um, that we receive. Um, one thing we just remind our coalition members is on your own personal time, you're free to speak about um, anything that you're passionate about. Um, we remind them not on federal dollar time, which is also includes vacation time, mm -hmm. um, that you are not doing any sorts of lobbying. In that time, we advocate and we talk about the issues and um, the importance of our issues. Um, but in your own time, you're free to discuss certain bills and um, how to how to get those passed through when you're when you're on your free time. Do you think that these rules um, have been intimidating for some from some grassroots leaders, or is it pretty straightforward? I would say yes. I think there's a lot of coalitions that just stay away from it altogether because they don't know where that that line is, and so they just um, they don't do any of it, and which can be unfortunate because there's a lot of things that you can really make a difference um, with your elected officials when you're advocating, and so I think it's important that they that they try to to do what they can. I would agree. And I think as we meet with state coalition leaders from across the country, as well as community coalition leaders, that's one of the things we hear most often is, well, we really want to do some lobbying and advocacy, but we really don't understand. And we're afraid. We're afraid that we're going to cross that line. And, and it, it's kind of like a maze. So I do think it's very intimidating. And I do think that's something we need to continue to work to educate our leaders And that's on. why that's why we're here. So Sue, can you give us a real great example of what is and isn't. You know, Absolutely. Of, yeah. If you're going to go and meet with your elected officials about the funding that you receive, the wonderful work you do in your community, what your outcomes are, what you've achieved, who your partners are, that's not lobbying. That has absolutely nothing to do with taking a specific position on a specific piece of legislation. Uh, even to tell them that the funding that you receive is critical, helpful, uh, and that you couldn't do your work without it is not lobbying. So going in and meeting your elected officials and educating them also about the drug trends, what's going on in your community is just fine. It doesn't even switch into lobbying until you say, I'd like you to vote for or against a certain bill. So please make sure that you vote for H.R. 3754. That becomes lobbying, but it doesn't cross the line until that point. I think that's a really important distinction. And, and um, how difficult is it to avoid crossing that line? I don't think it's difficult as long as you understand where the line is. And the other thing is if you're in a group of people, you can bring your board chair or somebody who doesn't have any restrictions and have them in the meeting make the ask that crosses over into taking a specific mm -hmm. position on a specific piece of legislation. The thing is to know the rules, to follow the rules, but not be afraid to, to lobby if you can do it. You just can't use any federal money to do it. 
And that's what we've done, I think, very effectively, is outreach to our coalition members who are not bound by those regulations, as well as our state coalition partners. And then even for the people who are involved in federal funding, for them to, there's, there's no restriction on emailing your senator or your congressman after 5 o'clock in the afternoon or after hours. You can go home from your home computer and send all the emails regarding something that you want. So remembering to kind of attack it from all sides and all angles. And, and I think that's much more effective. And youth, the youth pay a, play a very crucial role in advocacy because I think when they are speaking, especially about substance abuse and things relative to that, it's much more effective if the politicians hear the impact it has on their lives. So getting the youth prepared to go to Capitol Hill or to make those calls and those emails is certainly a very effective use of our of our resources. And we're definitely going to talk more about uh, the power of youth advocates uh, a little bit later in the program. So I have kind of a boring question, which is how do you keep your books straight? Like, is there some bookkeeping that needs to be done with your lo mm -hmm. lobbying and your your federal funds? How does that work? Heidi, what, what do you what do you do with bookkeeping? Um, we are 100% federally funded, um, other than our match and our in-kind money, so we stay away from lobbying, so we don't keep track of, of any of that time. It's all done on personal time, so that's not something that we, we keep track of or we worry about. We pretty much follow the same policy as far as the federal regulations. Again, partners that are not federally funded may choose to do that separately or in support of the coalition's uh, points of view. But we do use the state coalition's uh, strength and the fact that they're not federally funded. So um, yeah, just maintaining the books, making sure you don't go over the appropriate percentage of, of out or allocation of funds for that. And how do you guys handle any roadblocks in this in, in, in advocacy? Oh, <laughs> roadblocks. Um, you know, many times you you just have to think outside the box. Sometimes um, use use what resources you have. Um, seek out people in your community who may have the influence, um, and look to those those untapped resources and maybe the avenues you haven't quite thought of and sometimes those people and those people in power can help you get to what you need. Yeah. We stop, we regroup, we look at what the hurdle is and then we, like you say, think outside the box. We, we look at, okay, how can we go around this? How can we overcome this? And sometimes you have to use the non-traditional resources but there's no obstacle too big if you really are passionate about what you're doing. Perfect, and we're here to hopefully uh, make people feel much more comfortable about their, um, their power and their ability to influence. So one coalition had numerous hurdles to overcome while trying to find a way to solve a unique problem in their community. They worked hard and found answers. Two cities in two countries make up a huge binational area along the Rio Grande. El Paso, Texas and Juarez, Mexico are sister cities connected in many ways. Well, I think one of the biggest benefits of living in this community was the fact that we're right on the border with a major Mexican city. Juarez is one of the largest cities in Mexico, and we're smack on the border with it. Uh, we're right next to each other. And we have major ports of entry uh, where you can cross uh, by foot or in vehicle. And, uh, and so it gave you a great experience, uh, that, that bi-national experience. Recent drug cartel violence in Juarez has changed the landscape, but people still cross back and forth all the time, and many of them remember how things used to be. If you speak to a lot of the individuals in El Paso that are in their 30s, they remember when they were in high school, when they were 14, they could walk across the border, they could get served alcohol, they could get drunk, and then come back across and head home. Rows of bars used to line the streets of Juarez just across the border where the legal drinking age is 18. Even though you could drink legally in Juarez from 18 to 21, we had a lot of underage kids going over there too because they really didn't care about checking as much as you would here in the U.S. because it's a, it's a big deal to serve an, an underage uh, kid over here in the U.S. But over there, it's, it's really not. So they, you know, you could have a 16, 15, 14 year old over there drinking, getting drunk. And it was just a matter of parking their car uh, downtown El Paso and a little walk right across the bridge and they're in a foreign country where the laws are different and they're able to 
drink and have fun. What some saw as a rite of passage concerned the Rio Grande Safe Communities Coalition. Back there in Friday and Saturday nights, students coming over at about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning could be easily up to 2,000 in just that time frame. Drunk, coming across, stumbling, uh, some of them alcohol poisoning as they reached the bridge. Then they would often get into cars. We would deal with intoxicated kids. Some of them would get in cars and try to drive home. They'd be DWI, and you know, we've had some pretty bad fatalities. Options were somewhat limited. Well, unless we had um, a law or an ordinance or something on this side of the border, we really couldn't do a whole lot. We couldn't keep the kids from crossing the border. And, and what is, they made a lot of money selling to kids, so they weren't going to do anything. The coalition checked with other border cities to see what they had done to try to prevent underage drinking. We started out, we looked at what they had done in San Diego, and we tried initially to do something, to do a, a statewide law that would affect all of the border communities. We ran into a, a, an obstruction that we couldn't overcome, so we knew we couldn't do anything on a state level, so we started looking at what we might be able to do at a local level. A curfew seemed like a viable option, and the city of El Paso already had one in place, but it wasn't enough. So our existing ordinance was uh, in regards to curfew that after 11 o'clock, if you were under the age of 17, you couldn't be out. And uh, that was a citywide ordinance. But what we found was that a lot of these kids would go over there before 11 o'clock because they'd want to get there early to like, get their place where they're going to be hanging out with their friends and drinking. So the coalition leaders looked at what the city of Austin did on its 6th Street Entertainment District. Teens under 17 were not allowed there after 7 p.m., addressing a specific problem in a specific area. What we decided to do, or the coalition decided to do, was we need to address the specific areas. Where are they going across? And the two locations that they were going across were the two bridges that are located in downtown El Paso. And it's at those two locations that they were doing it. They would park their cars on this side, go across, get drunk, come back, get in their cars and go home. The idea was to stop the kids before they went over to Mexico. That would allow us, instead of um, having officers out there in regards to enforcement um, after the kids were drunk, after they'd become victims of crime, after they'd been assaulted, it would allow us to stop them and prevent them from uh, going over because if they were under that age, we could stop, hold them, turn them over to the parents and cite them. So we were actually uh, preventing things from happening. Operation Bridge was born by national resources to interrupt the drinking gateway environment. Now, the coalition had to make the city council aware of the problem and their proposed solution. As a coalition, we're not able to lobby, and so what we do is just educate and bring awareness. So we had to have all our facts and figures and say, no, this is something that we're looking at, and um, this is the uh, issues that we have in our community, safety, concern. We went to city council meetings. We got kids who went over to Juarez who came before the city council and talked about that. We had parents, we had kids, we had a lot of people come out to city council to, uh, to get up and, and talk about the experiences that they had had uh, to prove to the city council that it was a problem. The ordinance passed in March 2006, and enforcement began in the two areas surrounding the bridges on the El Paso side of the border. Kids that were found that were 17 and under in those areas during those times were held until their parents came and picked them up and um, on the first and second offense could get a fine of up to $500. And the parent, if the parent knew that the kid was out at that time in that area could also be fined. The media helped publicize the curfew and so did billboards around the city. The coalition began to see results pretty quickly. We found a significant curtailment in the number of kids crossing into Juarez and we saw that the, the bar owners in Juarez were now commenting about the fact that they were losing business. A great deal of their business came from El Paso, and the comment that business was being lost was a plus for us, in essence, because we were able to see direct results. But it's not clear how much of an impact the curfew alone has had. A variety of factors, including the curfew, helped to reduce the number of people going across the border to drink. At the same time, what was beginning to occur was that increase in violence over in Juarez, and that has had a substantial impact on reducing the number of people that go over there. Uh, we don't have those problems at all anymore because it's so dangerous to go over there that the kids won't 
typically do it. And the violence started picking up in the early part of 07. New passport regulations are also keeping people on the American side of the border, but they're still finding ways to drink. The partying moved from, El pa from Juarez to the deserts of El Paso and have moved to people's homes. They can't go across, so then we're gonna go out to the desert and have a party out in the desert. We've also seen a rise in um, issues involving social hosting, uh, parents providing alcohol to minors in their home, you know, with the kind of the mentality of, well, they're in my home, so, you know, I'm watching over them. And the issue with that, obviously, is that, well, they're drinking in your home and then they get in their cars and they drive back to their house. The border traffic has changed. It's now mostly people who work and shop in El Paso. By law, the El Paso City Council has to reconsider the curfew every three years. Right, what a unique um, community, first of all, and what a great prevention strategy. So what do you guys think about what happened in El Paso? I think it's very interesting that they learned from what other communities had done. Um, they knew that they had a roadblock that they had to overcome, and so they looked at their resources and what had other communities done that was similar to this that they could utilize in their community. I thought that was very unique and a perfect example of sphere of influence and understanding it. You know, really looking at what's happening in your community, un identifying what things you can and can't change, and then figuring out what you can do to effectively, you know, you may not be able to change everything you need to, but picking out the fact that you control things in your community even though you couldn't control what was across the border. Mm -hmm. And we run into a lot of that, I think, in our community coalitions because our state laws are different in, in different states. So we have to deal with what can we change, what can we influence. Um, she was talking about social hosting laws. And because of the way our state law works, we're not able to have social hosting ordinances in the state of Virginia. But we are able to control things like noise ordinances and that type of thing, which is very helpful and, and somewhat more effective. So I think that's a great example of that. I was really struck by three things. One is that they mobilized the whole community, parents and youth, to come out and testify in front of the city council mm -hmm. about the fact that what they identified as a problem really was a problem. And the second one was how they narrowed in on the two bridges, so they really identified exactly where the problem was. Mm -hmm. And number three, it's great to have a law or an ordinance on the books, but it has to be enforced in order for it to be really effective. And they were working hand in glove with enforcement to make sure that that ordinance was enforced. Right. Yeah, it's, I think that they certainly saw a big uh, impact when you see those young people Yes. testifying yep. in front of the city council. That always has a lot of power. So um, so they also had to think about timing. I mean, they had some. They had to time it when people were ready to, to um, embrace this type of curfew or that sort of restriction. So how does timing play in all of the influencing that, that we do? What do you think, Sue? Timing is critical, um, especially when you're doing anything with the legislative body. You have to understand when they're in session. You have to understand if you want something introduced, when that happens, and the whole um, process through which a bill becomes a law. Because if you're showing up at the wrong time with the best idea, you can end up out of luck if, in fact, it's not the right time to be introducing something or having it considered. Yeah. Well, and I think in working with your community, timing is, is crucial as well in terms of making your community aware of the issues. You don't want to pose a, a law or a policy in your community if no one is, is aware that there is even a problem. So I think a lot of it is um, education and awareness of your issue um, prior to proposing a, a solution to the problem. We are... Um, we've recently identified the synthetic drug products as a main issue in the state of Virginia and we were really struggling to get people to understand the dangers and how important it was uh, for us to address those head on and be proactive. And then all of a sudden one of the new synthetic drugs kind of fell out of the sky and landed in Chesterfield, Virginia. And that was very eye-opening. Um, several people landed in the hospital with emergency room visits. And all of a sudden, everybody is like, oh, OK, this is a problem. So the timing and the events going on in your state and being aware of those, uh, even though they're unfortunate circumstances, you definitely can use them 
to help you move forward and, and prevent things from happening in so the future. Are there, Heidi, is there something in, you, in your community, for example, where you, you think the community is not quite ready for that, but we're going to be geared up and ready when the timing is right? I mean, is that something coalition leaders have to be prepared for? Definitely. Um, like Sue said, social host is something that our community has spoken about, but we're just not quite there. Um, we have done a lot of research. We have a lot of um, sample policies that we've, we've gathered from other communities, um, and our, our coalition is ready when the community is ready, but it's, we're really still working to prep them and um, discuss alternate options and be able to, to work around the barrier, right. and, but we're ready when, it's, when the time is right. And speaking of sample policies, I know CADCA collects a number of policies for coalitions to take a look at. Sue, can you explain the policy toolbox that we have? Absolutely. Yeah. We have asked our coalition members around the country to send in any ordinances or laws that they have been able to get passed, and they fill out a form that actually explains why it was needed, how they made the case that it was needed, who they made the case to, who they mobilized, what process it went through, so that people who actually want, and the language of the ordinances is up on our website. Perfect. So it's a wonderful resource for people who are interested in looking at what other communities have done, and you just go to catgas, www.catga.org, and you click on the icon that says public policy and it'll take you to the toolbox. Perfect, and we'll have all of those resources up for everyone at the end of the program. So, well, we're gonna take a short break, and when we come back, we'll talk about how to do all of this influencing. How do you really get things done when understanding your influence returns? I was in junior high the first time I caught my mom using denial. She had to have known her painkillers were missing because I kept stealing them. Her denial was so out of hand. So she doesn't even know? I'm going out. It was like I could get away with anything. Your kids have fun. <laughs> and that was when I knew. And she was addicted to denial. Denial is a drug. Get help. The partnership at drugfree.org. My mom's a hardcore enabler. I first realized it when she said we should have a party at our house. We're we gonna have fun tonight. You ready? Yeah. She even yeah. got my dad okay. to say just okay. Just lighten up a little bit. Teenagers. Right, we're going back. Everybody's in the back. She's so hooked on enabling that. My friends think she's their buddy. If she doesn't care, why should I? Enabling is a drug. Get help. The partnership at drugfree.org. Welcome back to Understanding Your Influence. So guys, how do you know who's got the power to really make a change? Well, I think what you need to do is look at what you want to change and then decide what individual, what group, or what system in your state, community, or at the federal level has the power to make the change. So it's really a matter of knowing what you want to change and then figuring out who can actually make that change happen. And so what is, there's a tool called a power analysis. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that? Absolutely. A power analysis is really simple. It's just two big words for something that's easy. So what you need to do is figure out what you want to change. Say if you want to change a local ordinance, you need to decide who has the power to make that change. It would probably be the city council. And then you need to figure out who in that system you need to go to. You need a champion who can help you make the change. Usually it's a member of the city council who would be on a committee that would have jurisdiction over that. And then it's go time and understanding the timing as we talked about before the break. But a power analysis is just really figuring out what you want to change, making the case for why it's important to make the change, and then making the case to the people who have the power to help you make the change. And organizing your community and all of the other groups that would care about that change happening to support you in making that happen. So oh, it's simple. Power analysis sounds really cool too, so that's good. <laughs> yeah. Now have you guys used this power analysis in your work? 
Um, locally in our community, we did something where we used a power analysis. Um, we were working to change a school policy. So it was important for us to bring on the people um, in our community who had the influence to make those changes on the policy. Um, we brought together school administrators who could take that policy to the school board, the elected officials who made the decisions. Um, and then, like Sue said, we brought on youth. Um, youth, parents, coaches, anyone who would be influenced by that policy and really rallied them around the changes so that they could also speak to the people making the decisions about, about why it's important and why the school needed to make these changes. So yes, we've definitely done it successfully. I think we've used it a lot on um, both community and state level. We had some issues with alcohol advertising in the state of Virginia, and we really had to look at um, who was involved in that and who had the power to make the changes. And I think we found out some very surprising things as we were going through that process and were able to identify some issues that will help us, I think, moving forward. We were not aware that our state allowed for public comment on alcohol policy twice a year, and apparently no one had been providing public comment because they didn't know that opportunity existed. So now through um, identifying who is able to affect change, we've been able to open up a whole, whole new door to the public and give them the opportunity to have influence over public policy. Yeah, and that's a really important uh, way to advocate, yes. to be able to be aware of those sort of opportunities and get your get your word out there, and that's not lobbying. No. So um, let's talk about policy change a little bit more. Does it have to be a big change? Of course not. <laughs> like I said, we did a school policy. It, it was a pretty big change, um, but it wasn't at our national elected official level. It was you know it was locally with our our school board and our small community. So it was a, it was a small policy. Um, it was a big win for our coalition, but um, nevertheless, it, it wasn't a huge national movement that we got involved with. Yeah, some of the baby steps, I think, sometimes are the biggest steps going forward. Uh, we, we were able to just change where the children hang out in the community, give them a more positive environment, more positive family activities, and that really has a very uh, powerful impact on you know controlling the children's downtime, the unsupervised time, and therefore less things happening in the community that are negative. So it can be a very simple um, environmental change that makes a big difference. And sometimes these changes you wouldn't even think about, as you said, um, that they were necessarily um, directed towards um, alcohol, tobacco, or other drugs, but, but this, that environmental change right. makes all the difference in the community, whether it it's like in an urban area planting trees, you know, getting the law enforcement to block off a street so kids can play. That's, that's um, changing a policy in, that has a big impact. So now you've done, you've done local, lots of, Heidi, you've done lots of local policies. Um, have, aside from the schools, are there some other um, folks that have been partners that have helped you make some other changes around your community that are, have changed the environment? Um, yes, we've worked um, very closely with our local law enforcement to change their procedures. Um, so while it was a change in, in their policy, their guidelines, their operating standards, whatever you may call them, um, we changed the way that they did their work um, related to underage drinking. Um, they now have processes for compliance checks that are done on a regular basis in our community. They um, are working on a new policy and operations manual for um, enforcing underage drinking laws. Um, party patrolling, and they're really working on unifying and putting in place guidelines for their officers so that they're all following the same um, set of rules and procedures um, in our community. And so that's really um, working with the schools, working with our law enforcement. We're really getting a, a wide approach in our community um, to addressing underage drinking laws. For Sue Thaw, does the size of the community matter when you're doing these things? I mean, Heidi's a rural community. No. the. The rules of the power analysis apply whether you're talking about something that involves 100 people or 100 million people. Same theory, same practice. And you talked about earlier grass, grass tops. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain that a little bit more? Absolutely. So grass tops people in a community are the movers and shakers. They're the people who have influence because of either the positions they hold or so faith leaders, the heads of big nonprofit organizations, business leaders, 
the people in the animal clubs, the lions, um, all of those people are grass tops people because they influence their members, they have a reach in the community to citizens, and they're people who are key influentials because people listen to them and actually care about their opinions and where they stand on things. So those people are crucial to educate about the things that we care about so that they can become champions for what we're trying to achieve at the local level. And I'm sure that uh, Sue and Heidi have great examples of how they've gotten grass tops leaders in their communities involved in what they've gotten them involved in and how have you done it? Well, like I said, we, we worked with our school administration. Um, they were the grass tops. They were the ones that we really needed to, to influence and get involved. And um, without having them on board, I don't think our policy would have gone anywhere. So that was really important. And, you know, it was just making them aware of the issue and that the policy that was in place was hundreds of years old and needed to be revised. Times have changed. And they really took a good look at it with all of the information that we were able to provide for them. And I think one of the important things to remember when you're trying to mobilize a community is that the people that are in charge, the community leaders, are there because they care about the community. So making a one-on-one -on -one direct approach and really going to them and talking about why this is important to the community is really critical. And it really gets them more engaged in, in what we're doing. And I think um, we've been very effective so far in just getting them to understand um, the issues and getting them to support us in, in the things that we feel are going on in our communities. I want to talk a little bit with you all about young people and their power because we've mentioned them throughout the, the program, but how do we engage youth advocates? And Heidi, you know, you work with young people in your community. Um, how are they taught to be advocates? Um, we utilize our resources um, quite frequently. We have sent youth to CADCA trainings where they have learned the skills, how to be a strong advocate. Um, and then those kids who receive those national trainings will come back and teach the other kids. We have a group of over 100 kids. We can't feasibly send them all to a national training. And so we have smaller trainings locally where we teach them how to go out and advocate for things that they believe in. And our, kid, our youth have been very successful in changing policies. Um, they're currently working on a tobacco-free parks policy in our community, um, making the place where the children in our community play a tobacco-free zone. Um, they've been successful at tobacco-free ball diamonds. Um, all of the ball diamonds in our community were made tobacco-free due to the work of our youth. They were the ones who went to city council meetings. They came up with the plan. They presented the slideshow. Um, we were there to help support them and guide them, but it was really their project and their idea and their plan. And we just empowered them to, to have a voice for what they believed in. And how important is it that the young people are authentic and that the, it is, it's presented to par in, in a way that people know this is really coming from them? It, it's very, very important. Uh, we have a positive teen council group that serves as the advisory group to our coalition as well as other youth serving organizations in the community. So we bring them in from the surrounding counties and school districts and they come from, some of them may be athletes, some of them may be honor students, some of them may be average students, but they all come together and work together and they provide input for our coalition activities as well as for other youth serving organizations in building youth programming. And so when we set up a youth program, we turn to them for what are the topics that are important. They even help us with parent awareness by saying, these are the things we think our parents need to know that they don't know. Mm -hmm. So that's very effective in crossing the board about what our community needs to do. And I think people respect the opinion of the youth because they know it is genuine. Mm -hmm. And Sutha, I know we have trained youth advocates and prepared them. How, what's the best way to do that, to go up on the hill? Well, you know, just to talk kids through what to expect at the meeting, that they and their parents are constituents and that they are the ones who really know what's going on with youth in the community. So it is a very authentic voice. I have brought kids to the Hill who have said to congressmen, you know, more kids are smoking marijuana every 30 days or all the time than smoking cigarettes. And it was news to the elected officials. But it turns out not only was it true, but that the Monitoring the Future data two years later actually picked that trend up. 
So kids are living it every day, and I think elected officials really appreciate hearing from them. Yeah. Very effective. We, when we went to Capitol Hill Day this year, we took the majority were youth, and we didn't script that at all. We simply told them what we would be discussing and said, you know, think of stories or examples or things that were happening in your community that you can share. And the Senator's office commented on what an impact that had on working, you know, and moving forward to support those things. So. I think this is really important, Sue, what you said about the elected officials having, bringing them news, because people think that our elected officials know everything. Right. So how important is it that we spend some time when we're with them just in educating them? Oh, it, it's critical. Elected officials are generalists. If you think about even what a city council person has to deal with, potholes, crime, the water system. Um, so they are not experts on what's going on with youth with alcohol, tobacco, and drugs. We're the experts. The kids are the experts. The coalition who collects the data that knows exactly what's going on. That's the expertise, and local officials really appreciate being briefed on issues that they should know about and they need to deal with. And if we're not the ones who are bringing them this information, they're never going to hear about it from anybody. And they will let you know that, too. We had a um, similar situation at CAD CAD um, Capitol Hill Day this year. Our youth went and advocated for um, a cause, and after our meeting with them, we were notified that the senator or, or the congressman then did vote for um, what the girls were advocate, advocating for, and they felt so empowered that they could make mm -hmm. a change and that they were able to rally for their cause and that it made a difference. And so it's great to, to get that feedback and hear from, from those elected officials that it really does make a difference. That's awesome. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about um, where to influence because we had the great um, example in El Paso. Um, they tried for a statewide and uh, they found that they found some roadblocks there. So um, why does go not going statewide all the time work? You know, why is it better maybe to start local? Uh, what's been your experience as coalition leaders in, in terms of local versus statewide advocacy? Um, we've had experience with, with both local and state, and what we find is starting at a local level, you can really gather more support um, from other communities who are working on the same issues. So while we may be working locally, it can then beyond that affect a state level type of policy. Um, keg registration was a huge thing in Iowa. Um, many communities were trying to make keg registration an ordinance in their county. Um, that was beginning to happen and there were lots of communities making keg registration ordinances and the state said, why don't we just take this on as a state? And so really starting at that community level and then um, seeing how much of an impact it has can then escalate into the state policies. And as we said, you know, different states are different and you have to work around. And in Virginia, we have to do most things that way because we have a law on the books that says we cannot have a local ordinance that supersedes state law. So if you don't have a state law addressing something, then you can't supersede that. So we have to work through the system a little bit differently and kind of a triple, trickle up effect. And uh, so by enacting noise ordinances and party patrols and, and stricter enforcement that under things that are already on the books and then we take that information and we take it to the people in power and say okay these are this is our data this is what's going on this is what's working is there not some way we can make this a state law that we can put this so we can enact it throughout the state because it's effective and how about in, um, when we disseminate information? Let's talk a little bit about how we get the message out. What are some of the most important ways to once you've, once you've determined what policy you want to work on to really disseminate? How do you guys do it locally? Um, local newspapers are huge for us. Um, we don't have a TV station in our community that we can utilize readily available, so the local newspaper is huge. And anything you can get in a letter to the editor, everyone reads um, because we're a small town. Um, letters to the editor are usually controversial and so everyone reads those. It's the place to put your news. Um, but our local newspaper and, and via word of mouth um, because we are a small community, if you talk to the right people, the message is gonna get out. We have the ability to utilize a, a local radio uh, group that has country, hip hop, R&B, rock, so we're able to get our messages out on a variety of, of media 
uh, venues, which is really nice through the radio station. We do have access to newspaper and public access TV, which is very helpful. But I find a lot of it is by utilizing our partnerships in the community, simply getting the word out, sending those posters, sending those announcements, sending out the things that your coalition is working on and getting them out to as many people in the community. And all of a sudden you walk through and you see that information being posted in offices and, and really shared throughout the community as time goes. And I think that word of mouth is, is vital. And I think every community is unique, so we're, we're seeing that there's different ways to disseminate in different communities. But what about using the internet? Is everyone on board using that as a dissemination tool for influencing people? I think it's important to use all avenues that you have available to you so that you reach the most people. Um, we don't have a ton of people that utilize our internet resources, but we do have all of our information is on a website, we have a Facebook page, and we have a blog. Um, so they're kept very up to date on what's going on with the coalition, the issues that we're working on. So I think definitely the internet is, is one piece of the puzzle. We have the website, uh, which is, I think, really good for sharing information. A lot of people access that. But we also are now, we've moved into the Facebook presence. A lot of people are using that anyway, so they're willing to take a few minutes to check out what's going on. Uh, we have that for both our youth council, our coalition, and our state. We're also moving into the WordPress, which kind of substitutes mm -hmm. for the website and is a, a new format, which I think is going to be exciting. And we're looking at Twitter, so we'll see how that goes. Well, we certainly love Twitter at CADCO. <laughs> we're all over Facebook and Twitter. Um, but let's talk a little bit more about um, the planning that you would do um, for dissemination. Is that part of, as you make, you do your power analysis, is this dissemination plan part of your overall strategic plan? Oh, definitely. I think it's very important to make sure you plan um, how you're going to get the word out and the message out. And fact sheets, um, our youth are very, they love to have fact sheets, um, quick bullets that, that they can share with, with the important people, the people we're influencing, um, and then usually they leave them behind, um, something that they can give to that person so that they're reminded about the issues and, and what they're working on. And Sue, at the national level, I mean, what's your experience as far as media and its influence on these issues? Oh, it's gigantic. Now, even elected officials in the Senate and the House read their local newspapers. So as Heidi said, it's really important to use your local press, your local TV station, if you can get on it, because elected officials actually care very much about what's happening in their hometowns. And if you can get a story picked up in the national media, that's fabulous. And I know we were talking last night at dinner about this um, bath salts issue about mm -hmm. this person eating someone's face off, and it all of a sudden the synthetic drug issue went from something not many people heard about to all of a sudden it's on national TV and it's a gigantic opportunity for coalitions who have been trying to raise awareness about the dangers of these synthetic drugs to have a platform on which to do it given it's now all over the national news. So coalitions really need to be ready. That's a, a point around timing. You know, yes. they need to be aware of what's going on about mm -hmm. every single drug problem in their community. What is a priority? What about if the media makes something out of uh, something that's not really your your data shows it's not as big a problem. Sometimes things can be overhyped. How do you handle that? Um, I think it's important to use your data, um, bring it to the coalition, share the, the issue with them, and have a discussion about it in the community. Are you hearing about this? Are we seeing data that's showing that this is happening in our community? Um, ask your youth. Uh, they're a valuable resource. Find out from them what is happening in our community. Are you seeing this at, with your friends? Is this something that's happening locally? And really gathering the information before just jumping on the bandwagon with what might not be an issue in your community. Ongoing community assessment is important and tapping all the sectors to get information and get feedback. But again, you know, we want to focus on the things that really are happening in our communities, the things that we can make an impact on and have the most influence on. So it's important that we assess correctly as to where we should focus. And how do you turn the influence back to where it should be? What if someone that's a policymaker has gotten on something and it's not really where their focus needs to be? What do you do? 
I so. think you go in with the accurate data and you can say we're so glad you're interested in this issue, but the data actually shows that there's a much bigger problem that we need to be dealing with than the one you've identified. So let's let's talk about that. Let's actually share the data with you. And when you go in to talk to not only elected officials but any key influentials, a one pager of the data is about what they're going to look at. So you need to sort of condense everything down to one page. Mm -hmm. And graphs and charts are really important. And when we started on the synthetic drug issues, when they first started appearing across the country, there was really not a lot of information out there. So what we did was some basic research to compile a one pager that had data, it had reported incidents of use and the results, it listed health effects, that type of thing. The critical things that people need to consider when they decide you know, how to advocate for something or how to educate on it. And those one pagers went national almost immediately. Mm -hmm. There was a need everywhere for that information. We found them posted on senators' websites. We found them, um, we were getting calls from state police and and all over the place. And so just that little bit of information to help increase and advocate um, on issues is really helpful. So packaging the information yes. is very important as well. It is. What about those key partners that are outside the coalition? How do you get them to do your work for you sometimes? Heidi, is there a way that you talk them into that? Well, and I think using those same types of one-pagers to educate them and bring them up to speed on, on the issue, um, really encouraging and asking them, you know, for their support of the issue and why it's so important, um, really being able to, to drive home the message and getting them on board with, with why you're, you're doing what you're doing. And that continues on. I mean, when we put out the one-pagers on that, now they come calling for, for that information yeah. on a continuing basis for different issues. So it helps get, it helps create a, a larger sphere of influence. And Mel, it's so important when you're dealing with influential people, grass tops people, to do the work for them. If you want them to write an op-ed, write the op-ed for them. They'll, you know, change it on the margin and send it in. So do whatever it is mm -hmm. that you're asking them to do. Do a draft of it. You can't just ask people who are very busy to do all the work. So if you prepare them as much as possible and do all of the groundwork for them, they're much, much more likely to do what you need them to do. That's a good point. And what's the most important thing, Sue, that you really feel that coalitions should, um, should do as far as being advocates? I mean, what is the very most important thing that you would share with them? The most important thing you can possibly do is educate, educate, and educate. Educate everybody. Educate the regular people in your community, the business people, the faith leaders. Because once people are educated about what's really going on in their community, they're going to take ownership of it. So the assessment, sharing your data, and making sure people understand the local conditions, exactly what is going on in your community, to me, that's the most important thing that you can possibly do. What's, what do you think CADCA is really hoping for with, with this group of advocates that we represent? What do we really want to see from them? Well, we want people to understand that they themselves are grass tops leaders who have tremendous amounts of potential influence and that they need to recognize that and then do whatever they can legally within their power to exercise the influence that they have. Well, that is wonderful. And we are hoping that this program today has helped inspire many coalitions out there. I want to thank our panel. And that's all the time that we have for today. Thanks so much to Sue Thaw, to Heidi Bainbridge, and Sue Parr for sharing their knowledge. We'll leave you with some resources that you might find helpful. I'm Mary Elizabeth Elliott. Thanks for watching Understanding Your Influence.